Okay, thank you very much. So today is the second day of your workshop. And my task today is to talk about systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. Uh, just before we progress, uh, I can um, tell you that I wrote a book on systematic reviews, which has um, uh, been awarded the BMA Medical Book Award, and its third edition has only been released just in December last year. And my presentation is largely based on the five steps summarized uh, in a summarized form that uh, are described in detail in the book that I just uh, showed you. So uh, in the presentation today, I'll give a small introduction, then give you some detailed presentation of these five steps. And then I'm going to give you some writing tips uh, before reaching the conclusion. I should highlight that meta-analysis, the term refers specifically to statistical synthesis, which is step number four. And the systematic review is a combination of all the five steps lift, listed here on the left-hand side of your screen. <clears throat> the typical issue uh, concerning any paper, including a paper based on systematic reviews, is that we often have to go through a, a long cycle of revision and resubmission before acceptance. But I hope with today's presentation, you'll be able to make a strong manuscript that may be accepted in the first go on the first submission. So instead of boring you through my own curriculum that I provided yesterday, uh, again, I will just jump directly to what are systematic reviews and how to avoid confusion about them. So primarily in the published literature, there are a very large number of things called reviews. They may include even editorials and commentaries, uh, but they are not necessarily scientific articles. They are subjective opinions expressed by experts. A systematic review is a subset of these articles. And here the key feature is that a scientific strategy is used to avoid or limit the possibility of bias in, in the putting together of the evidence. Another word used is evidence synthesis. Now, some of these systematic reviews will benefit from performing the statistical synthesis called meta-analysis, but meta-analysis is not an obligatory part of a systematic review. In fact, in some circumstances, it would be, it would be actively uh, <clears throat> discouraged uh, because the evidence will not uh, be suitable for performing a statistical synthesis. So with this definition clarified, can I just check that you heard me clearly and that I can continue? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So we now move to something that I mentioned yesterday, which is that research translation goes through various stages. And you can see here that Evidence synthesis and guideline implementation are known as T4 translation. And this is how what you are learning about with respect to trials fits with the evolution of the evidence generated into a product that can eventually impact healthcare. And that impact is achieved or should be achieved through 
a scientific exercise that puts together all the trials conducted on a particular question through a systematic review. So, as I mentioned yesterday, the objective of conducting trials isn't just to produce a couple of lines in your CVs. It really is to improve the outcome for patients, communities, and society. So if you think about it, just three years ago, in this very month, in March, many countries underwent a quarantine to deal with the problem of coronavirus. And today, those restrictions have virtually all disappeared within a period of 36 months. And this has happened through the conduct of trials of vaccine and other trials necessary to control the pandemic and summarization of the evidence concerning these uh, intervention studies in systematic reviews. <clears throat> so the pilot and feasibility studies can be put together systematic reviews. From this, we learn how to do more of these studies better and inform how to do the large multi-center studies. And it is then putting together of the large multi-center studies in systematic reviews that we are able to achieve health impact. So your, your main focus is to learn about clinical trials. So here I present an example of a trial that is conceived in 1996. It recruited its last patient in 2006 and is published in 2009. So you can see that a clinical trial has a relatively long time span, depending on the question and the number of patients and the duration of follow-up required. <clears throat> but in the life course of this particular trial, at the time of conceiving the idea, a systematic review was carried out. And here you can see a publication, uh, title page of the publication related to this review. You've been listening to the construction of a budget. Presumably you create the budget to make a grant application. I can bet you that a grant application is unlikely to be successful for a clinical trial unless the application includes within it a systematic review of the topic within which you will carry out the clinical trial. And this systematic review should be used actively to help design the clinical trial for which you are seeking funding. So this first review that highlighted here in 97 was one of those reviews that underpinned the grant application for funding of this trial. Then during the course of the review, another uh, the trial, another systematic review appeared uh, because other parties, apart from the researchers involved in this trial, are undertaking uh, research in the same area. By the time the trial is to be completed, yet another systematic review appears, an update of the previous review after completion of recruitment but before publication of this trial yet another systematic review is published on publication of the trial a further systematic review is published this time with a more sophisticated approach to meta-analysis using the raw data of all the trials on this topic so you can now see that the life of a clinical trial is integrally related to systematic reviews and meta-analysis of the topic concerning which uh, we are undertaking our clinical trial. Now, systematic reviews, I mentioned to you earlier, are important for implementation. Here is an example. This is Scotland buying more than 150 kilograms of albumin 
a year uh, so uh, 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 every six months according to this uh, <clears throat> this uh, the, this timeline in order to treat people in who are critically ill a meta analysis then shows that in fact using albumin is harmful increases not decrease mortality and it's only after this meta analysis that combines uh, these various randomized trials on the topic that practice in fact changes and the amount of kilograms of albumin purchased in Scotland to treat critically ill people uh, in fact comes down uh, substantially because it's now learned that this intervention is in fact harmful. So we now return to the five steps of systematic reviews. The first step is framing the question with respect to the clinical process, we go through all the different phases of starting from understanding etiology to making diagnosis. It's important to understand that clinical trials typically relate to therapy research and therapy research attempts to create interventions or, you, or, or evaluate interventions that will improve the prognosis of patients. So we can undertake trials by randomizing individual patients, but we can also undertake systematic reviews of trials, combining the data existing in published primary studies. So this is the structure we would consider using for framing the research question concerning systematic review. This will be virtually identical to the way you will frame question for a trial, except here the study design will be systematic review that will put together data from primary studies. Again, a repetition of how a trial question is composed. Uh, primarily, you combine various studies that compare, compare a treatment with an alternative intervention to assess the outcome of patients exposed to a treatment, to a new treatment or the alternative. <clears throat> I highlight here reporting of uh, the extent to which patients and public have been involved in research. Uh, this reporting guideline is called GRIP2. I highlight this here for you because with respect to framing outcomes in particular, it is important that the outcomes selected for systematic review focus on what is really important for patients, not just what is important for computing a small sample size that is manageable, but it should be an outcome that will change the future of or the prognosis of a sufferer of the condition for which the intervention is being developed. And here collaboration with patients and the public can be highly relevant. And therefore, citizens can have a part in planning and conduct and dissemination of the systematic review. And here is an example of how journals are requiring the reporting of patient and public involvement in papers. <clears throat> so, the, so we covered yesterday, and I wish not to repeat how the study is designed, <clears throat> but I'd like to show you a little bit about how data are taken from trials to undertake some calculations for performing meta-analysis. So, as we know by now, patients are allocated by randomization to control or intervention, followed up for their outcomes, and then effect size is calculated. So imagine if 200 people are randomized, and imagine that no patient or data loss occurs in a hypothetical trial, <clears throat> then 
take it further. It's a trial concerning infertility. In the control group, 10 couples become pregnant out of 100. And in the intervention group, 25 couples become pregnant out of 100 on follow-up. Then how will we calculate the effect size for meta-analysis? So the first thing is to compute this two by two table where the outcome, in this case, pregnancy or failure to become pregnant is tabulated for intervention and control. And these data appear like this. And from these numbers that we already have, you can see that it is possible to compute the rate, risk, or proportion of being pregnant under intervention or control. And the relative risk is simply a division of one rate by the other rate. And this will be 2.5. The odds ratio, on the other hand, is the computation of the odds per group. And the odds ratio is the division of the odds in one group by the other, which is that. So these calculations, as you can see, are fairly simple. <clears throat> However, these calculations need to, as, as we discussed yesterday, will apply to the study sample within each trial. The beauty of a systematic review is that because we have several trials put together, they increase the possibility that the effect sizes when combined become more generalizable to the eligible or the general population who did not take part in the trials. So meta-analysis not only help with improving the reliability of the effect size, it also improves the applicability or generalizability of the findings concerning a particular question. Now, you may have already covered, <clears throat> and it's important to know the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. In general, an effectiveness trial is what we are looking for. We are looking for how beneficial is the intervention under usual circumstances? And here, the key features that define effectiveness relate to how the sample size is recruited. For example, the people come from less stringent eligibility criteria inside the study sample. The health outcomes are relevant to clinical conditions relevant to patients, not necessarily simply to achieve a small sample size. The duration of follow-up is sufficiently long, sample size is big, and the analysis is by intention to treat. And I take it, and I'm confident that other colleagues will have taken you through all these issues with respect to the designing of a trial. But given that a meta-analysis combines different trials, it has the possibility to, to generate uh, a summary result that perhaps will be more generalizable than individual result. <clears throat> Here we take an example of an infertility condition where the treatment is compared to control. Here are the data from various trials. The relative risks are plotted on this graph. Here you have the studies. Here you have the studies sorted by year of publication, the extracted data. The line of no effect is the relative risk value of one. The calculation of relative risk we have already seen. The point estimate is usually the box or circle in the center of the data presented. Here you can see one of those calculations highlighted for you. If this point is below the value one, in this case, it means that under treatment, less women are able to become pregnant. So the treatment is harmful. On the other hand, if the value of relative risk is greater than one, 
it means that more women are able to become pregnant under treatment. So the intervention is beneficial. The confidence interval is the uncertainty of the point estimate. <clears throat> and this I would recommend that you calculate just simply using a statistical software instead of a calculation by a handheld calculator. And the, the meta-analysis <clears throat> has the ability to take all these data presented and combine them into a single result. You can see here in this meta-analysis that none of the single results of the trials are statistically significant. And this is because the confidence interval include the value one. <clears throat> Now, in the first set of slide of uh, presentation, the studies were sorted by year of publication. But in the second example, they are sorted by study quality. And here you can see the figure already looks different. By year of publication, we cannot learn anything other than the effects are randomly distributed. Uh, or virtually randomly distributed according to the year of publication. But by study quality, we can see that as quality changes from high to low, the result appears to have a particular trend. So you can see that the way you present data in a meta-analysis helps you understand what the, what, what the combining of the results uh, will achieve or can potentially achieve. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if the range of possible effect sizes is shown in this type of uh, space described by the various circles, then if the truth effect size is expected to be in the middle, which why we might call the effect size that is free of bias, <clears throat> then those outside the true, you could say, are the opposite of the truth, which is potentially untrue or lies, to put it in simple terms. Then combining the concept of reliability with validity, we can have a result that is valid and reliable. But potentially, we can also have a result that is valid but not reliable and the other options. And the validity is captured by assessment of risk of bias. So instead of year of publication, the risk of bias or validity assessment is a more suitable or informative way of putting data together. Here we show the same set of data again according to quality. And for meta analysis, when we put these data together in a statistical software, the result produced is summarized normally in form of a diamond where the points if estimate is in the center and the ends uh, <clears throat> horizontally of the diamond represent the confidence interval. And <clears throat> here we see the confidence interval of the diamond, but look, it's important that we see it in light of quality. The high quality studies show that potentially the treatment is harmful and certainly is not statistically significant because the diamond is crossing the line one. But it is the low quality studies which has show a statistically significant result in favor of treatment. In this case, the conclusion cannot be that this treatment is effective. In this case, the conclusion got to be highly cautious because the high quality studies do not demonstrate any benefit. <clears throat> In the interest of time, simply to show you that small studies, i.e. studies that have wide confidence intervals or the lines that cross the point estimate or the central point are wider in small studies. 
typically in small studies the expectation is that the studies with negative result or non statistically significant result will be missing from the literature so <clears throat> a study with a true result with a narrow confidence interval will be more likely to be published but a study with a wide confidence interval with a positive result will be more likely to be published this is called publication bias and is captured through an analysis called funnel plot analysis shown here so here you can see that possibly studies are missing from this part and i can show it to you possibly through another example when the studies are missing this is called an asymmetric funnel plot <clears throat> and this is because small studies tend to have a negative result and are not attractive for submission or acceptance and therefore are not accessible when we carry out literature searches this problem has got to be solved by what i covered yesterday which is all studies should be prospectively registered in this case those undertaking systematic reviews will not end up missing studies because if studies are registered then systematic reviewers have the ability to search registers to find what studies have been planned here is a real published example of the same analysis that i showed you a moment ago but an updated version of it and here they have concluded that the treatment is appears to be effective in improving pregnancy rates however if you look at this funnel plot it is clear that there are some missing studies i think you will obviously see that appears to improve as stated in this publication got to be a highly cautious conclusion you cannot just jump from here to make a guideline in favor of the treatment <clears throat> there is another example where i want to emphasize the issue of quality we are talking about randomized control trials but if randomized control trials are not available we tend to use non randomized studies in this case i advise you to take more seriously the studies that are of a cohort design than of a case control design because of the higher risk of bias in the case control design <clears throat> finally once this statistical synthesis has been performed a, a systematic approach is required to put the evidence together in order to reach a conclusion concerning a recommendation and this goes through various steps even in the case of randomized trials which would normally be regarded as a high level of evidence we got to consider other limitations for example uh, is the outcome measuring the true effect indirectly or possibly there is inconsistency of results or possibly there is heterogeneity that is important in this case the final quality assessment of the literature even from randomized trials may be low and if the outcome assessed is not important the strength of the recommendation may be weak 